Hi there everyone. Today we're going to talk about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a tensor, the spectral theorem and spectral decomposition <coughs> of symmetric tensors, and the polar decomposition, well the square root of a symmetric positive definite tensor, and the polar decomposition of any invertible tensor with determinant greater than zero. All right, so first we'll define an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. <clears throat> a scalar omega is an eigenvalue of a tensor S if it satisfies this. So tensor S in Lin V, <coughs> if there exists a vector V in the vector space, V is not equal to zero, such that S acting on V is just omega <coughs> times v. <coughs> In this case, v is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue w. Omega, rather. <coughs> so since <coughs> S is linear, if V is an eigenvalue with, or rather, if V is an eigenvector with corresponding eigenvalue omega, then all scalar multiples of V are also eigenvalue or eigenvectors, and they get scaled by omega as well. <clears throat> so S of alpha V is equal to <coughs> <coughs> alpha S of V is equal to omega alpha V. <coughs>
so the the space of eigen <coughs> vectors associated with a given eigenvalue is a vector subspace of v <coughs> which I'm sure you already knew from your undergraduate classes. <clears throat> so if S is not symmetric and V is a vector field over the real numbers, <coughs> <coughs> then we know that we kind of have to extend our notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to include complex numbers for the eigenvalues, they occur in complex conjugate pairs. And the eigenvectors, we'd have to think of them as complex eigenvectors that would occur in complex conjugate pairs. At least if we want V, the vector space, to be spanned by eigenvectors. <coughs> Within the context of this course, um, we're really only going to be looking at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, <coughs> of symmetric tensors, <coughs> which we know have real eigenvalues, and their eigenvectors are in mutually perpendicular characteristic spaces, and we'll get there in a little bit. <coughs> In this lesson, we're not going to talk about how to calculate the eigenvalues. Um, that's going to come in our final lecture on vector and tensor algebra, which will be on section 2.16. So that'll be the principal invariance of a tensor and the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. But that'll be the next lecture, which will be probably put that one out on Sunday. I'm going to be out on a backpacking trip uh, tomorrow, which is Friday through Sunday, so <clears throat> won't have a chance to post it until then. Uh, but that'll still give you plenty of time to <clears throat> finish the last little bit of the homework that involves that. All right, so like I said, um, we don't have to worry really about the complex eigenvalues because in terms of our eigen anything in this class, we're going to be restricting ourselves to symmetric tensors. Um, <clears throat> and really we're going to be looking at the eigenvalues of things like the measure of strain. Uh, so that's going to be a symmetric one and we'll get into there. <clears throat> So let's suppose we have a symmetric tensor S. That'll be in sim V. 
and omega 1 not equal to omega 2 are distinct eigenvalues of s with corresponding eigenvectors e1 and e2. <coughs> Well, all right, <coughs> omega 1, E1 dot E2 is equal to S E1 <coughs> dot 1. There we go. E2. Well, that is equal to E1 dot S transpose E2 by the definition of transpose. And since S is symmetric, that is equal to E1 dot S E2. Well, since E2 was the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue omega 2, <coughs> That is equal to E1 dot omega 2 E2 is equal to omega 2 E1 dot E2. Well, the only way that omega 1 E1 dot E2 can equal omega 2 E1 dot E2 there are two things. So one, omega one is equal to omega two. We stipulated it is not. Oopsies. or 2, <clears throat> E1 dot E2 is equal to 0. So E1 is perpendicular to E2. And so <coughs> this tells us that the eigenspaces of distinct eigenvalues of a symmetric tensor are mutually orthogonal. All right, so now on to the spectral theorem, which gives us a way of representing symmetric tensors, a very convenient way. So if S is in sim V, it's a symmetric tensor, and we're saying dimension of V is 3 here. which is only going to affect the bounds of the sum in a little bit here, or the number of elements in the orthonormal basis. <coughs> <coughs> then there is an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors of S with corresponding eigenvalues so that we can decompose S in a neat way.
So S, the tensor, is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3 of omega I EI tensor product EI. Because this has three I's in it, <coughs> um, we can't use the summation convention here, so we have to write out the sum. And this is going to be with each omega I real, because it turns out that the eigenvalues of a symmetric tensor are real. <clears throat> the, uh, the proof that symmetric tensors have real eigenvalues is a bit of a pain. Um, you can find it on the internet, but we're not going to go through it here because it would just take too long. Um, but you might have seen it at some point, but otherwise you can just take it to be a fact that symmetric tensors have real eigenvalues. So this form here, making a symmetric tensor the sum of three tensor products of a unit vector with itself where they're mutually orthogonal, <clears throat> this is called the spectral decomposition of S. If S has three distinct eigenvalues, <coughs> then it's unique up to multiplying <coughs> the eigenvectors by negative one. But otherwise, if there is a repeated eigenvalue, you know, one that has a characteristic space of dimension greater than one, then you know, we could look at any orthonormal basis for that space that has dimension more than one. So really, you're just talking about rotating and reflecting a given orthonormal basis in there. <coughs> and so it's not unique in that sense, although, you know, of course, the tensor is itself always going to be the same. So here are the three possibilities in three-dimensional space. This is for S in sim V. <coughs> the first is that omega 1 is not equal to omega 2, is not equal to omega 3. So we have three distinct eigenvalues. <coughs> defining mutually orthogonal <coughs> eigenspaces. So E1, E2, and E3 are uniquely determined um, up to a factor of minus 1. You know, so you could have E1 or you could have minus E1, <coughs> and it would be the same since minus E1 tensor product minus E1 is the same as E1 tensor product E1.
So even if E1 could really be plus or minus E1 and E2, same thing, um, so they're not unique. The, uh, their tensor products are. <clears throat> so in that case, there's only one spectral decomposition of S. Two, we have one repeated eigenvalue. So omega one is not equal to omega two, but it is equal to, so omega two is equal to omega three. <coughs> So in this case, E1 is uniquely determined up to, you know, a factor of minus 1. And E2 and <clears throat> E3 are arbitrary within the plane spanned by any other choice of E2 and E3. So in other words, any two orthonormal vectors within the characteristic space of W2, or omega 2 and omega 3, will work for that. <clears throat> so, you know, in the top one we have S is equal to omega 1 E1 tensor E1 plus omega 2, E2, tensor E2, plus omega 3, E3, <clears throat> tensor E3. In this one here, we have S is equal to omega 1, E1, tensor E1 plus omega 2, which is equal to omega 3, E2 tensor E2 plus E3 tensor E3. <clears throat> well, since E2 and E3 are, well, E1, E2, and E3 are an orthonormal basis, um, then we have that the identity is equal to EI <clears throat> tensor EI. Here I is summed. So it, it follows that E2 tensor E2 plus E3 tensor E3 is equal to the identity tensor minus E1 tensor product E1. <clears throat> and so this means that S is equal to omega 1, <coughs> E1, tensor product E1, plus omega 2, identity, minus E1, tensor product E1. <clears throat> so this is nice in that it gives us a, a way of expressing S that doesn't depend on calculating something arbitrary, right? E1 can only be one thing up to multiplication of minus 1. So, you know, E2 and E3 are arbitrary within the plane that is omega-2's characteristic space. But in order to express S in this form, we don't need to actually calculate them. <clears throat> so E1.E1 E1 is just, you know, it takes the component of a vector along E1 and then multiplies it by E1. So it just projects it onto the line defined by E1. And 1 minus E1 tensor E1 projects it into 
projects any vector into the plane perpendicular to E1. <clears throat> so this is saying that uh, this term just projects it into that plane and scales it by omega 2. All right, so the third and final possibility is omega 1 is equal to omega 2 is equal to omega 3, and we'll call that just equal to scalar s. <clears throat> well, in that case, the tensor s is equal to that scalar s times the identity tensor. So in that sense, a symmetric tensor can be viewed as a non-uniform scaling along three mutually orthogonal directions. <clears throat> That's a symmetric tensor. That would be principal stresses or stretches is one term for that scaling for the three stretch factors. <coughs> and principal directions. So it's probably reminiscent of, you know, Moore's circle and your, your principal stresses and principal directions and everything from your undergraduate mechanics classes. <clears throat> Two tensors commute, <coughs> so like ST is equal to TS, if they have the same characteristic space. <clears throat> or as the textbook puts it, T leaves the characteristic spaces of S invariant. <clears throat> All right, so now positive integer powers, or at least non-negative integer powers, of symmetric tensors. So let's say we have a symmetric tensor S that therefore admits a spectral decomposition.
moment. So here we're looking at orthonormal GI again. All right, well, S squared is equal to S times S is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3, J going from 1 to 3. <coughs> Omega I G I tensor G I Omega J G J tensor G J. <coughs> well, that is equal to the sum I going from one to three. J going from 1 to 3 of omega I, omega J, G I, tensor G J. <clears throat> That's a terrible J. G I dot. GJ, right? So we took this GI and this GJ, right? When you have GI tensor EI times GJ tensor GJ, then the middle two can get interproducted with one another, and you just get the tensor product of the outer two. <coughs> <coughs> well, that is equal equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3, J going from 1 to 3, omega I, omega J, G I, tensor G J, delta I J, since it's orthonormal basis. So we can get rid of the delta and replace J with I is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3, omega I squared, G I tensor, G I. <clears throat> so in other words, S squared has the same, this is for a symmetric tensor S, S squared has the same <clears throat> eigenvectors as S, and the eigenvalues are all just the squares of the eigenvalues of S. And so in general, S to the nth power is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3 <coughs> omega I to the nth power G I tensor G I for S in sim V and N equals zero, one, <coughs> etc. So any non negative integer. Um, if N is equal to zero, we see this just gives the identity. Um, if S is positive, definite, and invertible, this also works for negative integers, and it works for um, non-integers. So, you know, you can look at, like, the square root or the cube root, things like that. You probably remember something to this tune <coughs> from the diagonalization of matrices in your undergrad class. Um, and it is the same idea. By the way, um, we can also calculate the trace and the determinant this way <coughs> in terms of the eigenvalues. Again, this is only for a symmetric one.
So we have this spectral representation. <coughs> So the trace of s is going to be equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of omega i g i dot g i. And g i dot g i is, of course, 1. So that is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of omega i. <clears throat> so the trace of a symmetric tensor is just the sum of its eigenvalues. And what about the determinant of S? Well, let's let U equal G1, V equal G2, W equal G3. Well, SU is equal to omega 1U. SV is equal to omega 2V, right, since we picked them to be the eigenvectors. And SW is equal to omega 3 w so <clears throat> su dot s v cross s w is equal to <coughs> omega 1 omega 2 omega 3 u dot v cross w <clears throat> so from our definition of the determinant, right, SU dot SV cross SW divided by U dot V cross W. Um, and, you know, since we picked this basis here, U dot V cross W <clears throat> is non-zero. So the determinant of a symmetric tensor is just the product of its eigenvalues. <clears throat> All right, now let's talk about a positive definite tensor. So a tensor C <clears throat> in lin V is positive definite if <clears throat> u dot c u is greater than zero for all u in v u not equal to zero. <clears throat> So in other words, it can't um, map it to something that's more than 90 degrees turned from the way it was originally facing. Right, it can't put it back. So, you know, here's, let's say that this is U. Then here's a plane perpendicular to U. CU can be anywhere from all the way here to here, and it can be as long or as short as it wants to be, but it can't break that plane. <clears throat> All right, so if C is also symmetric, 
It admits a spectral decomposition. C is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of omega i <coughs> gi tensor gi with the gi set orthonormal. All right, well, gi dot c gi is equal to omega i for each i. <coughs> so if, um, if c is positive definite, then omega i has to be greater than 0. Strictly greater than zero. <coughs> so a symmetric positive definite tensor has strictly positive eigenvalues. They can't be zero and they can't be negative. <coughs> It turns out to also be the case that a symmetric tensor having strictly positive eigenvalues is also positive definite. So we'll prove that. <clears throat> So let's say we have a symmetric tensor C. So it admits a spectral decomposition. Let's say it has strictly positive eigenvalues. And the G I set here is orthonormal. <coughs> then for any V in our vector space, um, we have V
can be expressed in components as v is equal to v i g i like that. So let's restrict our attention to v that is not 0. Then we have, <coughs> so at least one of the components <coughs> is not equal to zero. You, know, you could have all of the but one equal to zero, but if V isn't zero, some component of it relative to this G basis has to be non-zero <coughs> by virtue of the fact that it's a basis. Then, um, all right, we have C, V, is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3, J going from 1 to 3, <coughs> omega, omega I, G I, tensor G I, V, J, G, J. Well, that is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3, j going from 1 to 3, omega i v j g i g i dot g j by the action of you know this tensor on this vector. <clears throat> well, this becomes a delta ij. <coughs> so we can get rid of the j and replace all the j's with i's and get rid of the delta. So that is equal to the sum <coughs> i going from 1 to 3, omega i v i. G I. <clears throat> so then V dot C V is equal to the sum I going from one to three, sum J going from one to three of V J G J dot. <clears throat> Omega I V I G I and all the scalar components are going to come out and we'll get G J dot G I which will be delta I J so we can eliminate the J's replace them all with the I's again so that is equal to the sum <coughs> I going from 1 to 3 of Omega I, V, I, V, I. <clears throat> so, you know, it's equal to 1 to 3 omega I, V, I squared. Well, we know that omega I, we've said, is strictly greater than 0 for all I. <coughs> <coughs> was our stipulation about C, that it has all positive eigenvalues. <clears throat> and VI is non-zero for at least one. So VI squared is greater than or equal to zero for all I. And VI is non-zero. for at least one i, so <coughs> <coughs> we 
we have that um, the sum i going from 1 to 3 of omega i v i squared is strictly greater than 0, which means that v dot c v is strictly greater than 0 for our arbitrary choice of v. So a symmetric tensor with strictly positive eigenvalues is positive definite. For a positive definite symmetric tensor, the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, so it's positive, strictly. Uh, determinant. So that's greater than zero, and the trace is equal to which is also greater than zero. <coughs> Make sure we proved that. Yep, we're good. All right, so now let's talk about the square root of a symmetric positive definite tensor. So given a positive definite symmetric tensor, Uh, there exists a unique symmetric positive tensor u so that u squared is equal to c. <clears throat> so this is there exists a unique is the exclamation point positive definite u in sim v such that u squared is equal to c denoted <coughs> u is equal to the square root of c all right so if we look at the spectral decomposition of c The eigenvalues are all strictly positive since we're talking about positive definite C. 
then it's pretty easy to show that the following form for u is a square root of c. So we take the square root of the eigenvalues and leave the, um, the eigenvectors the same. Let's show that it is a square root of c. So u squared is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3, sum j going from 1 to 3. <clears throat> square root omega i g i tensor g i square root omega j g j tensor g j <coughs> well you know, this times this is going to be gi tensor gj times gi dot gj. And gi dot gj is delta ij. So got, we'll put both the omega i and the omega j under the square root, g i dot, or rather we'll make a delta i j there. And then g i tensor g j. <coughs> well, we can you know, use the delta ij to get rid of the j and replace it with the i and make it a single sum. So that's equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3, square root omega i squared, g i tensor g i. Well, since omega i is greater than 0, that equals the sum i going from 1 to 3 of omega i g i tensor g i, which is equal to c. <coughs> so that proves that this u is a square root of c. <coughs> and because we restricted the square root to be positive definite, u is the only square root of c. <coughs> Otherwise, we could have picked minus the square root of one of the omegas in there, <coughs> right? And if you square it, then the minus cancels out. The, um, the proof is simple enough, but <coughs> the proof in the textbook has a little typo in it. So let's go through the proof, um, which is not that bad and we'll make it make a little more sense. So let's suppose we have two different 
tensors that are both symmetric and positive definite, where when you square them, you get C. So u, u prime, and c are all symmetric and positive definite. <clears throat> then let's say that e is an eigenvector of c with corresponding eigenvalue omega. And since c is positive definite, we know that omega is strictly greater than 0. <laughs> equal the square root of omega. So lambda is also strictly greater than 0. <clears throat> All right. Well, in that case, CE minus omega E has to be 0, which can be written C minus omega times the identity acting on E is equal to 0. Well, that is equal to u squared minus omega times the identity acting on e. <coughs> Since uh, we said that u is a square root of c. All right, well, we can factor this here out into 0 is equal to u plus lambda times the identity u minus lambda times the identity times e. <coughs> right, so lambda squared is omega and uh, plus and minus u lambda i cancels out. All right, so now let's let the vector v equal just this first part here times e. u minus lambda times the identity acting on e. So that u plus lambda <coughs> times the identity acting on v has to equal 0. Well, oh, that'll be vector 0. This implies and this is where their typo was, that um, u v is equal to minus lambda times v. <coughs> lambda, again, is strictly greater than 0. Um, they had an e instead of a v here, so that could kind of throw you off a little bit. Um, well, if v is not equal to 0, then it's an eigenvector of u. Whoopsies. And its eigenvalue.
is minus lambda, which is strictly less than 0. <coughs> so u is positive definite. <coughs> only if v is equal to 0. Which is to say that u e is equal to lambda e. <clears throat> so each eigenvector of c must be an eigenvector of u with corresponding eigenvalue lambda is equal to the square root of omega. So we've come up with the spectral representation for the square root of c. which is to say <coughs> that we've, we've said what u has to be. Um, so if we fix the eigenvectors to be g1, g2, and g3, we know that they're eigenvectors of c and its square root. So the square root of c is equal to some i going from 1 to 3 root omega i gi tensor gi. <clears throat> well, because they have to be positive definite, this is equal to u, but it's also equal to u prime. So they have to be the same tensor. The square root of a symmetric positive definite tensor is therefore unique. All right, next on to the polar decomposition theorem. <clears throat> and this one is pretty darn useful in calculating strain and rotation in finite strain cases. Um, it's also a, <clears throat> you know, so it's super useful, like in nonlinear 
um, elasticity, but it's also really annoying to calculate compared to, say, the skew and symmetric decomposition. All right, so suppose we have a tensor F that is invertible and its determinant is strictly positive. then there exists a unique U and V, both symmetric, and a unique R, orthogonal, tensor, so that it, F has a right and left polar decomposition. So F is equal to R U, which is equal to V R. <coughs> These are respectively the right and left polar decompositions of F. Before we prove that it can be decomposed in this way and find a way of calculating it and show that it's unique, Let's, uh, let's consider F transpose times F and F times F transpose. So F transpose F. What's the transpose of that? Well, the transpose of F is F transpose and the transpose of F transpose is F, so that is equal to so F transpose F is symmetric and the transpose of F F transposes again. So that is also symmetric. <clears throat> All right. We're going to now show that both of those are positive definite if F is invertible and has determinant greater than zero. So uh, u dot f transpose f u is equal to f u dot f u. Ah, man, class took a turn for the, the contentious, huh? People saying f u to each other, oh boy. <coughs> All right, well, that is equal to the square of the magnitude of fu. Um, and so if u is not equal to 0, then this is greater than 0. Since f is invertible. All right, similarly, 
u dot f f transpose u is equal to f transpose u dot f transpose u which is equal to the square of the magnitude which is again greater than zero for all non-zero u since if f is invertible f transpose is invertible All right, so the determinant of f being greater than 0 means that f transpose f and ff transpose are symmetric, and they're positive definite. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> now we're going to show values that work for u, v, and r, or rather u and v, and figure out what r has to be. And then we're going to show that those are the only values that work. So u is equal to the square root of f transpose f v is equal to the square root of f f transpose is equal to r u r transpose work So first off, um, since we proved that f transpose f is symmetric and positive definite, as is ff transpose, that means that u and v here are both symmetric and positive definite. All right, so if f is equal to r times u, then f transpose is equal to, oh, by the way, I don't know if I, yeah. Yeah, so in this decomposition here, um, yeah, yeah, I did say u and v are symmetric, positive, definite, and r is a rotation, strictly a rotation, so determinant of r equals positive 1. All right, so F transpose is equal to U transpose R transpose. <clears throat> and since U is symmetric, that is equal to U R transpose. So F transpose F is equal to... U R transpose, right? So that was this. 
and then it's going to be times ru. Well, if r is a rotation, then r transpose r is the identity. So this is just equal to u squared. <clears throat> so that's good. That much works out in terms of f equaling ru. And then f, f transpose is equal to V R R transpose V by the same logic, and that's going to equal V squared. So that's good. All right, now we're going to prove <coughs> that R actually is a rotation. And uh, we're going to do that by saying let r tilde equal f times u inverse. And we know that u inverse exists and is also symmetric positive definite since u is symmetric positive definite. All right. Well, in that case, r transpose r. So we haven't shown that it's a, uh, a rotation yet. We're going to show that it is, <clears throat> is equal to u inverse transpose f transpose f u inverse. Well, u is symmetric, so u inverse transpose is u inverse. So that is equal to u inverse f transpose f u. And those are both u inverse there. All right, well, f transpose f is f squared is equal to u inverse u, u, u inverse. Well, that, right, these two multiply together, become the identity, same with these. So that is equal to the identity. <coughs> So that means that R transpose has to equal R inverse. And R is orthogonal. Well, the determinant of f is greater than 0, and it is equal to the determinant of r times the determinant of u. And the determinant of u is strictly greater than 0. So you know the determinant of r has to be plus or minus 1. Um, for this whole thing to hold, this has to equal plus 1. So r is a proper rotation. Well, let's, uh, let's put tildes over all these r's, huh? There we go. <clears throat> all right, so we got r tilde is equal to f u inverse, and f is equal to r tilde u. Let's call r without the tilde as uh, what we just defined r tilde as there.
All right, so if v, v is equal to r u r transpose, then v r is equal to r u r transpose r, r transpose r is the identity, so that's equal to r u, which we've already demonstrated is equal to f. <clears throat> so these are correct right and left polar decompositions of f, and in the next little bit we're going to show that they are the only left, or rather right and left polar decomposition of f, provided f is invertible with determinant greater than zero. Let's show that they are unique. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to use tilde again, but now tilde has nothing to do with the tilde before. These are just saying, suppose we have another r tilde, u tilde, and v tilde that are not the same as r, u, and v that we just established above. So f is also equal to r tilde u tilde, <clears throat> where r is a rotation and u is a symmetric positive definite tensor. So now we're saying suppose we found some other rotation and symmetric positive tensor that fit this decomposition. All right. Well, f transpose f is equal to u tilde transpose r tilde transpose r tilde u tilde that's not a very good tilde right well r tilde we've stipulated is a uh, a rotation so that is equal to u tilde squared. Well, u tilde, we've stipulated, is symmetric positive definite. And if the square of a symmetric positive definite tensor is equal to f transpose f, which is a symmetric positive definite tensor, then we know that u tilde has to be equal to f transpose f, which is the same as what we calculated for u. And similarly, <clears throat> let's say we have some other r now, r prime and v prime. v prime r prime well f f transpose is equal to v prime r prime r prime transpose v prime transpose, right, and v prime transpose, since it's symmetric, is just v prime. So that's equal to v prime squared. 
So v prime is equal to the square root of f, f transpose <coughs> is the only possibility for v. Well, you know, if f is invertible and we've said that u and v can only be one thing and we've shown how to calculate them from f and those are invertible and symmetric and positive definite and everything, that sort of narrows down our possibilities for r and r prime. <clears throat> so, you know, it can only be what we already calculated for r above. So the only thing that we can have is r tilde is equal to r prime is equal to r, which is equal to f u inverse. Ugh. Which is equal to v inverse f. All right, that's it for that. I know that was kind of a longer lecture there um, with a bunch of proofs and stuff. Boy, my wrist sure hurts from doing the iPad thing. Um, the next one on um, the principal invariance of a tensor and the Cayley-Hamilton theorem shouldn't be as long. It should be fairly short. You know, if you look at that section in the textbook, I think it's like three pages. Um, at any rate, after that, we'll be done with the algebra stuff and be going on to a couple weeks, probably like two weeks of calculus, and then hit kinematics, which is where, you know, the, the biggest chunk of continuum mechanics is, is like describing kinematics, and then we go into the balance laws for a little bit, and then the rest of it's like thermo and how to make constitutive laws that work with the second law of thermodynamics. Um, all right. Have a good one. I'll catch you guys on uh, the other side of the weekend.